Hi, I'm Scott Golick. I'm the director, producer, editor, and funder <laughs> of uh, Set Documentary at Hot Docs right now. You're watching the film craziest show. Hi, my name is Tim Wyckoff, and I'm one of the documentary subjects from the documentary set, and you're watching the film craziest show. Cool. I'm excited to have you both here to talk about uh, set because mostly because I had never heard of this before. I did not realize that table setting or uh, table, sorry, tablescaping would be a competitive sport. Is it a sport? <laughs> yeah, that yeah. should be my first question. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I mean, just I'll just give you a quick run through. I mean, set is a, um, a documentary about competitive table setting. Um, in the film, I follow around um, gobbles of people as they prepare their tables for six, seven, eight, nine months, you know, as they get ready to set the table. This is something that I, in my personal life, I always kind of competed to um, you know, do it as quick as possible and, uh, you know, just get done with it, eat the food and be, you know, move on. But um, uh, these people, they spend um, up to a year working on table setting. And I learned in the process that um, it's an art form. And like any art form, it just takes a lot of time to do it. And um, uh, I have Tim, uh, I, I, he's been setting the table. He's with us today. He's been setting the table professionally for, gosh, 30 years. Or competitively? Not quite. So close to 30 years. Not that long. <laughs> but I mean, you've been, why don't you tell us about how long you've been setting the table um, competitively? So competitively, I started at the age of uh, 16 um, because when I would enter art and other things into our local county fair, I saw the little table settings that they would do for the, the younger people and they got these giant ribbons and I wanted one of those ribbons because they didn't give them out for art. They only give them out for table setting. So I wanted, and they call them rosettes, but I really wanted them. So it's been since like 16, so 43. So heading towards 30 years, but not quite. So most of your life, you've been setting the table competitively. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Nice. Now, now what was your, your first table setting was uh, competitively was the Lion King, right? As an adult, yes. Um, as a junior competitor when I was 16, it was actually prom. And I used the prom picture of me and my friend that we, we had gone to prom that year prior and did a whole little prom setup. Um, but my first adult comp competitive that I actually won was a Lion King table. Okay, cool. Now, when, when you approach like setting a table, do you, um, is, is the menu as big of a factor or is it mostly just the decoration? The menu is the most important because it says what kind of, it's going to say what plates you're going to have on the table, what utensils, et cetera. So my starting point is theme, then menu, then the rest, because the menu is what's going to sell what you're doing. So the menu for me is the most important. Nice. Now, there's four categories, I believe. Do you, do you have a category that you don't like for the judging? Mm -hmm. Overall appeal, because I feel that's subjective. That can be up to whatever you, anyone can say it's not appealing. And then another person's like, no, I find it very appealing. So subjectivity on that one's a little bit rough. So that's the hardest one to win over in my opinion, because setting up the uh, you know appropriateness of the table uh, setting itself, the place setting and glasses and things like that, for me is black and white. It is, there are rules, inches, everything. So for me, I'm like, yes, yeah, that, that's the one that I feel the most confident in. Okay, cool. Now, now you, you do cosplay as well. Mm -hmm. Like, are do you find those skills like interchangeable with your table setting and then cosplay? Oh, absolutely. Because they both require sewing. Um, they include the idea of aesthetic. Um, so the idea of like how your character is going to look on your body and how your clothes fit on your body. Same idea translates to a table. The the length of the tablecloth, how things are highs and lows, placed on the table decoration wise, all of that is very integral. So for me, they, they feed a very similar need, but they're not the exact, but they're so similar. And that's why I love both of them so much. Okay. Now, you know, you, you mentioned like the length of a table, like 
Mm -hmm. I, I remember in the doc, everybody saying that the circular tables are a bit more intimidating than the mm -hmm. rectangular tables. I, you... I won't do a circle. No. I won't do it. No, you can't make me. If they don't have any rectangle tables, I'm not competing that year. Really? So the argument could be made because everybody in the movie kind of says the same way because so what happens is the fair pre pre presents you with a theme. So in the movie, it's um, international travel or light it up. And then you have to pick within that a circle or a rectangle table. And then the rules get really convoluted and how it all works. It does, we don't really dive that deep in the movie about um, how that all works because it's not interesting. But, um, but what is interesting is that everyone hates the circle table. It's like really hard because you have to remember all of your, 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 everything has to be about an inch away from each other. And just geometrically, if you're on a circle, the math there is like really complicated. So, but the argument could be made if, because a lot of people feel the same way is if you enter the circle, uh, you might not be, be competing as, as many people in that category because everyone just says, you know, screw it, we, we're going to do the square one. So that's a, that's a strategy that people could use. That's true. Uh, so, so a circle is its own separate category. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the circle tables compete against the circle tables, all the rectangle tables take, compete against the rectangle tables. OK. Sounds and then everyone funny. competes against each other for best shape. Ah, uh, OK. I was going to say it sounds kind of shapist. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way. That's great. <laughs> No, do people kind of like, it sounds like there's kind of like a com competition in itself to beat each other to the tables at the start of each fair. Yeah, uh, our, Bonnie and I are very much the same. Like Bonnie says that she checks often to check to make sure she can get into the table and does it immediately. I connected so greatly with what she was saying with that because I'm not at, quite at the same level as she does, but I do the same. I will scour the internet at least once a week when I know that it might be coming out to be the first to get my the table size that I want and the shape that I want. And a fun fact, um, at the date of recording this, I'm not sure when it's posted, today's the day that everyone was allowed to sign up for the Orange County Fair. Uh, oh, really? The, uh, yep, to, oh, okay. it was today or yesterday. So I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you could sign up, sign up for this year. It's gonna be in person? Oh, is it Scott? Yeah, it is in person this year. Last year they did a virtual fair where everyone kind of posted their pictures and then you could like vote on it. And um, a couple of the the people in the movie did enter it last year and then they had me vote and you know, <laughs> but you know, it's not the same as the in-person experience of going and kind of seeing the tables. I mean, everyone can look at tables on online, you know. Oh, that's good to know. I'm totally gonna do that today. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> hey, <you're welcome. laughs> now um like you, you had mentioned like signing up early to get uh, the table that you want. So it, you pick it online instead of mm -hmm. like first come, first serve? It's first come, first serve, but it's first come, first serve online. So uh, it's all done digitally. So you have, they have drop down menus for you to choose what you want, et cetera. Then you, um, there is an entry fee um, okay. to, to reserve your table, et cetera. Okay. There's so many. So layers. in the, in, in, so setting the table like on competition day, yeah, they spend six to eight months, you know, building these tables, getting them ready, but then they have to break it all down, put it into their car, drive to the fair, make sure nothing breaks. You know, you hit a mm -hmm. pothole. I've heard stories of all oh, my glasses broke, you know, and then you're, you don't have any glasses. You're messed up. And then once you get to the fair, you have only four hours. Like, and like, this is a, this is serious stuff, you know, like start time, end time. And it's forks down after those four hours. Hours, you cannot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, adjust anything just like you would in like a real sport. These are real rules with real consequences. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, did, did we establish if it's a sport or not? <laughs> <laughs> I sweat yeah, during I mean, it, but I'm the sweatiest human. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> like, I, I think I, I, it's a sport enough for me because I sweat, but I'm also the sweatiest human, so it doesn't matter. I'm going to sweat no matter what happens. <laughs> I mean, it's the spirit of competition either way, right? Hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Now, I, I feel like the like the biggest like comp for this would be like the work of Christopher Guest with Best in Show, even though that's a mockumentary and this is very much real life. Do you, did you take any like inspiration from that one, Scott? 
So I like as I was making the movie and as I was editing the movie and now that people have started to see the movie and reviews of coming out, a lot of people have drawn that parallel. Um, I purposely did not watch the movie while I made what, what I did not watch Best in Show or Waiting for Guffman or any of those fabulous movies um, while I was making the movie, editing the movie. Um, my girlfriend still hasn't seen it. Um, so I think now we can watch it. I just didn't want to be influenced by it. You know, um, but I, I did grow up watching that movie and, and loving it and Spinal Tap and all of these kind of great mockumentary uh, films. But uh, this is real. And 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 the the irreverence that you find in this movie, the heart, the passion is not scripted. It's it's all real. These are real people. And um but um, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy when people draw that parallel because that's such a fabulous movie. Okay. Yeah, I, it's one of, I saw it a couple of years ago. It's one of my favorites. And I was just like, okay, like, it's interesting that you didn't uh, watch it like lately because like, I found like just some of the humor is like similar in a way, but not like a ripoff or anything, right? Yeah, no, definitely not. I mean, it's they're they're a ripoff would be scripting a, a movie and and sure. casting actors and then doing that. This is this is um, you know I I found the competition at the fair by accident and I kind of got uh, when I was looking at the tables at the fair I was kind of looking around and I just knew that there was something deeper there. Um, you know, like I've said this before, but you know you know how like dogs predict earthquakes they start you know barking you're like why are you barking and then you know the earth starts shaking um i just knew it when i saw these tables that there was something special here um so um influenced by it maybe in some sort of um subconscious way having seen that movie growing up but um didn't watch it during the, the three years making this movie um by design now you said three years making the film i uh, just like logistics when when what year was this fair? So I, I uh, summer of 2008, um, I stumbled upon this competition. And then it pretty much the next day I went to work trying to find people, learn about this process. And then, and then in 2019 is uh, the summer of 2019 is when we filmed the competition. But keep in mind, we had filmed over eight months leading up to that point. Um, and then, you know, meeting people like Tim and all these other people, and then about a year editing and here it is summer 2021. So about three years. And it's it, after doing the math, it, it sounds a little, it sounds crazy. It's, it's definitely a, a slice of my life, but, um, I'm happy to have cut it out for this film. It's, it's, it was really rewarding and meeting wonderful people like Tim along the way. Okay. And just to clarify you summer 2018 that you found it. Yeah, I found the competition in 2018. We filmed it for the 2019 competition, but then, you know, there was about eight months of filming leading up before that 2019 competition. Uh, then 2020 is a wash. I was editing it and here we are in, I think we're in 2021, right? I, or so, I don't know. I ran out of fingers to do the math, but um, yeah, it took, took, took a lot of time. No, it's, sorry. It's okay. I, sh I should have just glossed over it because I think you misspoke and said 2008. So I just you wanted didn't say to... 2008. 2008? Oh my said. goodness. <laughs> That's a long we shot time. it on Betacam and the film. <laughs> <laughs> and then came back to it 10 years, like 11 years later. I know. That's what I yeah. thought you was like, oh, oh goodness. <laughs> Now that's that's pretty interesting though that just like spending that much time on it and then like like you said earlier that the table setters themselves they they do it for like six months as prep right. Well, let's talk to Tim. I mean, Tim. Um, so let's talk about specifically your table that you did for the movie this year. I um, mean, how how long did you from conception to kind of actually setting it up did you spend on it? So from conception, it was March. Um, I think in two thousand eighteen is when they released um, the tables and the themes. So from March of two thousand nineteen for me was when I started the process of coming up with the theme and then how I wanted it to be and, and mocking it up, et cetera. So from March until I think it was July, yeah, it was July, was when the, the, the competition was. So however many months that was, you know, April, May, June, July. So like yeah, four, for me it was four months, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people I know that they kind of, they, they've worked on their table even before the competition announces what their theme is, and then they try to like pigeonhole their theme into like whatever the competition puts. So when I say people work on it up to a year, I mean, it's facts. 
<laughs> and um, you know what's what's in, uh, Daniel. What's what's fun about this is that um, Tim actually saw the movie for the first time last night, so he's really fresh about it. So uh, I'd love to hear. Um, and I know that you just watched it right before you know we signed on here. I'd love to hear you guys' commentary back and forth about it being very fresh in your head. Um, do you want me to go first, Daniel? Yeah, sure, Tim. Um, having watched it last night for the first time, as a participant, I was worried about how I was going to be portrayed because it's out of my hands. You know, I'm not editing it, et cetera, and how things existed in my brain are not how they exist in the real world. Um, so I was really happy to see how I personally was portrayed and how my personality came across and, and how I act, how I do things and the experience I was going through at that time, because it was a very difficult time for me to be doing what I was doing. And it still showed how it, there wasn't defeat. There wasn't, you know, a lot of negative things while negative things were happening. I still was able to participate in this and have fun and enjoy it for what it was and seeing everyone else's story because I didn't know any of the people who were involved. So we didn't meet each other until the day and some of us didn't even meet each other. Like some people were done before I even showed up to put my table in. So there are people that are in this movie that I still never met in person. And seeing their story for me was really, really fun because I saw myself in some of the things they did and then like, oh, you do it like that. Okay, well, good for you. <laughs> I I enjoyed it. The the storytelling for me was the best part. It was so human. So what Tim's talking about, and Tim, stop me if I'm speaking out of place because we mm. did explore it in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, when I when I met Tim, um, you know, so the, the competition takes place in Orange County, California, and for those who are not familiar with the area, it's it's kind of known for an um, an area of excess. You know, it's very opulent. It's it's in between San Diego and Los Angeles, and it's across. The, it's right next to the coast, and it's a lot of big houses, a lot of um, uh, expendable income. You know, and and so some of these women they spend up to seven thousand dollars on their table to win basically bragging rights or a um, a ribbon. And um, I when I met Tim, I was talking to him, and and he had just. Um, lost his job, unfortunately, and was kind of struggling with all of the, sh you know, shrapnel, for lack of a better word, that comes along with that. And he was really, um, he was nervous at first about um, kind of having us come film and speak to him because he was in a, in a, in a vulnerable state. I, and again, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong here. You are absolutely correct. Yeah. And so, you know, we, I, you know, we, I, we spent a lot of time on the phone talking before we filmed and I, I wanted to let him know that where my intentions were, you know, this wasn't the sort of movie where I wanted to kind of take advantage of anybody or make fun of anybody or kind of put anybody in like a light. And I just I said, I think that your story is important to tell here. Um, and because whereas this table setting is kind of this, um, you know, it's from Victoria times. It's about this kind of affluent thing. And, but for Tim, where I learned throughout the movie is that it, it, it created something so much more for him. It was um, it it was therapy and setting the table. And you may out there, if you're listening to this, you may hear setting the table therapy. Like, what is that? Well, remove the word setting the table and just put art. And if I were to come in here and I were to say, hey, um, Tim used his art as a therapy when he was going through some tough times. Um, you wouldn't scoff at that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say, oh, that sounds weird. But that's one of the things I learned in this movie is that table setting is art. And once you define it as art, it's, you look at it very differently. And, and, you know, just the simple things of going around and, um, you know, paper mache and as monotonous as it is, it kind of gave him a minute to not think about the job hunt, which we've all been there. It sucks. It sucks. I think I speak for everyone when, when that, the, you know, applying on Indeed and doing all that crap just yeah. sucks. There's no other way of putting it in. You need something, you know, and that's what people are saying. It gave me purpose. purpose. And that's the thing that I needed at the time, like with what he's saying, it brings back kind of those emotions, those thoughts that I was living through is it gave me something to look forward to. Instead of like like you were saying, Scott, about the indie, the endless searching in indie, the endless sending out of resumes, the endless denial emails, it gave me something happy to enjoy and to you know surround myself with, even if it was only for maybe an hour a day. 
maybe less depending on on what I was doing. So yeah, it was it was I was really happy that that story that my story was told in the way that it was told by Scott. I I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, and again, we just we talked last night for the first time after he watched it, and um, you know, I did slightly repeating myself of what we discussed last night, but it was really important to me. You know, I was nervous to share it with Tim um, just because I knew how important that was to him about how he was portrayed in the film and didn't, he, in his words, he didn't want to seem like a sad sack. <laughs> he said that and, and, and he wasn't, he's not, because I don't, when you watch the movie, hopefully you don't see somebody who's, who's complaining that they can't, you know, get a job or something. You see somebody who's trying. And he gives a voice to a lot of people and you just insert table setting where something else was. And, um, you know, thanks again, Tim, for, for letting me into your world and trusting me with, um, with everything you did. And thank you for, for wanting me to be a part of it and then and for allowing me to voice my concerns to you and listening to them. Being heard is important and I'm very grateful for it. Oh, I'd give you a big old hug if I could <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, and just just my experience with that part, like I I have when I've had jobs, they've been it's just the gig economy because I've done journalism and script writing, so it's a bit tricky. So I just I related very much to your story, Tim. I'm glad. I'm glad that that you could get that from my story that you were able to connect with with that. Yeah, and, and I was very happy that you were the one com the one of the subjects coming on to speak with us because Yay. like just from the first line when you were like like oh this is the whitest thing that I do I was like okay this is gonna be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Would you think about what it is that we were doing it, on just on a surface level, nothing more? It it it's it's some white people stuff. It really is. <laughs> But I'm not lying. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong to make things pretty. There's nothing wrong to, to put, you know, your artistic spin on something like a table. And there's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with saying that it's some white people stuff. But it's some white people stuff. It really is. <laughs> I mean, it probably comes from the Victorian age, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, throughout the movie, you know, I asked everybody where if they knew where the competitive table setting started, and no one knows the answer. And it was it was going to be I had a montage early on that was cut with a bunch of people having no idea, you know, what the hell they were doing, but it got cut for time. I mean, the original edit was about two and a half hours, so I got it down to an hour and forty five minutes. Cut some people, of course, wouldn't cut my Tim. <laughs> 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 and you do have some like great sequences that you edit here just with like like even even with just Tim like those moments with Tim and and Hillary where he, like Hillary's just well yeah Hillary's just saying oh like you got these at the dollar store like there should be more creativity and then you see Tim just saying like oh wow like this person is an artist you can tell the design that went into it so I just I thought that contrast was very interesting. Talking about that, I will be perfectly honest, hearing her say what she said was hurtful. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, I'm not gonna lie about it, it was hurtful. Yeah. But I also, at that point, have to take a step back. <clears throat> what has she experienced in this competition? What has she experienced in what she's producing where people have you know, dumped on her and how she does things? And it's just like, a reaction to pain that you're already that you've been suffering through. What I said about her table, I stand by 100%. I was shocked that it didn't do better because it was so interesting and it was so artistically done and there were so many amazing details. And if <clears throat> she didn't know my story, she didn't know what I was living through. She didn't know that I was jobless at the time. She didn't know that I was trying to put a table together for as cheaply as I possibly could. So I can't be so angry with her, but I can say that what she said really hurt because it did. But when she said that the little baskets looked like poop, she wasn't wrong. <laughs> she, so, she was absolutely <laughs> correct because they did. <laughs> to provide some additional context for what Tim's talking about for maybe people who haven't seen the film yet. Um, there, so, uh, you know, as we discussed earlier, you know, Tim was on a budget. And so he did what he could with the income that he had and was going to the dollar store. And I thought it was quite impressive with what he was, able to do with, you know, 
without the means, you know, that some of these other people had. I, I thought it was very impressive, but uh, um, Hillary is another um, uh, subject in the film. And she, um, you know, she, she's wonderful in her own right. Um, she's, she's, she's um, uh, her own person, um, you know, big personality um, and is an artist and puts her, and, and will tell you that this table setting is her art. And so, so instead of placing, making like a table that say something really nice to sit at with forks and a knife and something that you could see yourself eating, she, she looks at it as it more of a, an opportunity to create um, a statement, you know, something that would create a reaction. She says it in the movie, love it, hate it, and have a reaction to it. At least have a reaction to it. Don't make a Thomas Kincaid painting, she'll say. You know, you know what I mean? Just to have, have something. So okay. this year she decides in the movie that um, she goes into a hyperbaric chamber and she comes out and the idea had formed in her head. And she, she says, well, I'm doing Africa. But specifically to Africa, I want to talk about the poaching problem that's happening. And so uh, my table is actually going to be the poacher's revenge. Um, and so it's all these taxidermy animals, real animals on her table that have come to life and there's blood and bullets and everything splattered all over her table. Like you wouldn't want to eat at this table, but when you look at it, you would say, oh, the, po the, the animals had kind of taken their revenge on the poachers and, um, they've killed all the poachers. So her table, her table's a statement piece. And, and, you know, um, so she goes around and she likes to look at the other tables in the movie and provide some co colorful commentary. And when she gets to Tim's table, not having known Tim's struggle, she immediately starts attacking it. And it's, um, it's near the end of the film. I don't want to reveal too much. Uh, but it's um, it's definitely one of those moments, jaw dropping moments in the film. You, you wonder, oh, table setting, somebody saying something negative about another person's table. How could that be entertaining? Well, once you go through the journey up to this point, it all the pieces connect. And uh, so what's interesting, Tim, uh, so mm -hmm. I actually showed Hillary the movie last night for the first mm -hmm. time. I sent her the link and um, she liked it thank God. Uh, but she said the only thing that she felt bad about in the entire movie, and believe me, she has a lot of um, s statements <laughs> that are pretty radical and outrageous <laughs> throughout the film, um, was the comment that she made towards your table, not having known your backstory. And of course, we all knew that this would happen. Yeah. Um, but she also said throughout the movie, people pile on her table and they say a lot of negative things about her table. And so, you know, she'll dish it, she'll take it, you know, and that's why this movie is kind of fun. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm grateful that she, that she's sorry that, that that's what happened. And I mean that honestly, but again, having the understanding, she had no idea. I can't be angry at her because she didn't know my story. In that scene, I didn't even know she was there. That's the best part about it. That's my favorite part about it. Yeah, just with her. Yeah, so you. there's a, and I'll, you know what I'll do is I'll actually, I'll send you the picture, Daniel, at the end and you can have it. Uh, oh, you didn't send it to me. You forgot I'll to send it to me. everyone. Please, All right, please, please. everyone's on a group chain. There's a, there's a point in the movie where um, uh, Tim is talking about Hillary's table and Hillary is in the background um, but Tim doesn't know that it was Hillary who, who that was her table. Like she, he didn't, he didn't know. And, um, is talking about the sort of person that would make this table. And, um, and she took a photo of him, but you could just see me in the background behind the camera with a big old smile. Cause I knew we were getting a great documentary moment. <laughs> <laughs> I had no clue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that part. That was, um, and I appreciate you, you for providing all that context, Scott, and keeping this conversation on track <laughs> with that. <laughs> yeah that's really helpful yeah and it's also like I think it's interesting that it does start a conversation about like just not knowing where people's backstories before you judge I guess right mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. you don't know what people are going through you don't know what trauma they've experienced or what experiences they've had in the idea of creation of art what their art is because that's what this is you never know what their story is some people have more affluence some people don't 
You know, to, if you want to get really film school and deep on this, um, you you just talk about not judging a book by its cover. But in in and so in the movie, you have um, Tim picks an international travel theme, and he decides to base instead of going to like London or Italy or Africa like Hillary, he decides to base it on a book. Oh, the places you'll go, and you know it's a surface um, on the surface. It's just kind of a fun little book about you know. Um, the, you know, telling oh, where life takes you, you know, um, but if when you really kind of read between the, the text, it's, it's, a, it's a book about um, struggle and it's a book about um, um, life. And look, life is not, you know, it's not this point A to point B situation with a bunch of smiles in the middle, you know, and, and if you were to kind of apply that book and and that's and I think that book is it was symbolism for kind of your your table at the same time, Tim. I don't it's, correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're absolutely correct. The whole reason that I chose that that book and, and that as my theme was because I knew first and foremost competitive why that's why so that's the first thing I thought of. Everyone's doing going to do London. Everyone's going to go to a specific place. Everyone's going to do a globe. I don't want to do that. So the next thing that came to me was all oh, the places you'll go because it's, it's telling someone that is growing up, that life is not easy. There are celebrations, it can be beautiful, it can be colorful, but it can also be dark. It can be sad and it can be difficult. And that for me speaks more than a, a table about a specific location on this planet. You're gonna be traveling, like I, I, the way my theme originally was, someone graduating from college and going, and going off into the world and possibly going on like a, a gap year or, or you know, a year off after college and traveling the world and seeing the world and, and enjoying life. That was the thought that came into my head, which is why I created what I created with the, the signposts pointing different directions and the balloons and, and that kind of thing. It was about the journey of travel, where you're going to go, but it wasn't about a specific place. So that's why I liked that theme. And it spoke to me very heavily because I liked that book and I loved what it was saying. And it absolutely had to deal with what I was going through because before my life was so much better. I was, you know, cruising through life, things were okay. And then I hit the dark spot. I hit the sad spot and I was living through it. Why not speak about it on my table in a colorful, uplifting way? I love everything that you're saying. And I, yeah, just appreciate all the vulner vulnerab vulnerability that you brought here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I was also curious, just um, you, there, there's a conversation about it kind of in the film, and I hope I'm not getting too personal, but just mm -hmm. with um, how you're the only guy there, is, is there, oh. is there, are, and you said at one point, like some of them quit because you're still table setting. Like, are they happy to have you in that community? Because I really hope they would be. So that community was actually the community from my hometown where I grew up in Ventura. Okay. Um, I had never competed in Orange County before. Uh, it was seen earlier in the film, but this is the first time I got a chance to because my job kept me from doing that. Um, when I say that people stopped competing because I was there, it's more in the context of in where my hometown where it was a smaller competition, wasn't the tables weren't as broad or as grandiose. I did well, and I did well often. And I, I would win often. And at a certain point, there were other men that another, at least one or two other men that competed besides myself that didn't do as well. And they got upset over it. And when you, just like any group of any competitive, anything, there's going to be gossip. There's going to be, there's going to be, you know, smack talking. And it's going to be one of those things of you hear from, you know, through the grapevine and telephone, whether or not it's true or not. But they left because they're tired of me winning. Ah. Go home or do better. Like, sorry about it. I love it. <laughs> so they, did, they couldn't compete. Okay. <laughs> they couldn't. And it, it, I know that I didn't want them there. I didn't want to be the only man. Like that doesn't, being the only man in a, a predominantly female space doesn't bother me. I don't want to take up a, a tremendous amount of space there. I know my place. I'm here to set this table. I'm here to show my art. I'm here to be nice to other humans because we all share the same passion. So why shouldn't we, why shouldn't we celebrate together and the things that we do and, and geek out over Waterford Crystal and where we got our plates and how we built our, our centerpieces? Why shouldn't we connect in that way? Male or female, it doesn't matter. We all share that passion. That for me 
is my favorite part. The con- like was I didn't get to tell you this last night, Scott, but the the part where Bonnie and I are con- you know talking about, it, she's like, these are Waterford. I'm like, oh, I could tell, and I was so excited for her that she had Waterford crystal on her table because it's expensive and it's beautiful and it's kind of that that tier of table setting level of like I can afford this let me put it on my table and you kind of inspire to be able to reach that kind of level of like well there's Waterford on my team yes <laughs> I love that I think it's yeah Waterford so I learned this I you know I I, I have plastic cups in my house because I break everything so you know I didn't know this going into it but um you know Waterford glasses is the most expensive glasses that you can own they are you know they can be a couple hundred dollars a glass and um one of the um uh one of the people in the film uh, her, her name is Bonnie Overman um, she, she is doing another Africa table, you know, big drama there between her and Hillary, but you know, you'll have to just purchase a ticket to hot dogs to learn about that. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, she, she couldn't find the right glass. And so, um, you know, she's going to all sorts of antique stores and looking at 5,000 glasses, but not one of the glasses was the right glass for her table and ultimately of course it's the uh the $150 Waterford is the one that ends up there and um she's placed next to Tim in the competition who had gotten his for a dollar plus tax so uh, <laughs> you know it's but his, 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 his I gotta say your glasses look pretty good look pretty good <laughs> my favorite thing about it is that the wonderful thing about that interaction with Bonnie as well is I was telling her how I had bought all of the the plateware at the dollar tree or the dollar store because I didn't have money to be able to buy something better or produce something better. And there was no judgment from her. That was the thing about that interaction that was so lovely is that not for one second was she just like, oh, she was just like, oh, that's so great. You did it so cheap. She was excited about my own excitement of being able to afford this and put this on the table. And that's what she's like, she felt, she was almost like a little meek about it. Like they're Waterford. And I was like, yes, Waterford, please Waterford. (laughs) Please make that happen for you and for everyone else. Um, Scott, I have a question. Does she have those in her arsenal? That wasn't really discussed. Um, yeah, I guess she had found them or and then her aunt or like it was somebody in her family or something and she didn't know they were Waterford. But, oh, so you cool. know, you just got to, you know, with making a movie with with so much so much material, you just oh, got yeah. to kind of cut the fat. You know what I mean? And that oh, absolutely. That's why I asked you because you yeah. would know. <laughs> yeah, no, she, she had them, but it it reads a little more interesting in the movie when you think that she bought them, but you know, we pulled back the curtain a little bit for you today here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah. We, we love expensive. We love frugal anything. Right. I mean, it's, it's all art. And I think that's, what's very interesting about set and like, and especially with like that edit of just like, I think what makes it so much just cements the fact that it is art is just how differently Hillary can see her theme of uh, African safari. And then how, differently Bonnie can see that same theme and just what they come up with. I thought that was very, very, very cool. Yeah, big rivalry, big rivalry in the movie between the two Africa tables, who will win? I was not expecting that in the movie and I told that to Scott, I, that was not what I was expecting and I loved every second of it. Thank you, Tim. I loved it. <laughs> I was so interested in everyone else because I lived my story. I knew what my story was. So I was so interested in everyone else and I was so happy to be able to witness their story. It's a joyful movie. It's it's in the times that, that we've been living through and, and what we've lived through the past year, having something that is joyful is such a nice relief. And that's just even though I'm in it, yeah, I can I can pump up Scott all I want, but in the, the honest truth of it is I enjoyed watching it because it made me feel good. Yeah, and, and that's another thing why what another why I it's hard to say I like my own movie because, you know, but, but. You can say it. You're allowed to um, say it. The, uh, no, I mean, look, I'm proud of it, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, um, I'm proud of it. I put a lot of time and energy into it and I'm happy with the way it came out. Um, but I, uh, right, right now, I feel that the documentary space is oversaturated with a lot of these heavy documentaries. I'm not trying to put them down because they are important. They have important social issues. I'm a big documentary fan. Right now, I, they gave me the password to hot docs. I just, I binged all last night watching really important, well-crafted documentaries about really interesting and valuable things. But sometimes 
you just need a little bit of oxygen into your lungs and just like a breath and an escape. And like right now, especially with what's going on with COVID and all the other, you know, ancillary things that are happening as a result of it, um, you know, we're living in a documentary, you know, um, we're, we're, you turn on the news and you're like, oh, crap, that's what's happening outside my door. I mean, we're in wild times right now. And sometimes you just, as a human, you, 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 just, you just need a minute to just kind of watch a table setting documentary. And, <laughs> and that's what this is. It's fun. It's an easy watch. It's a, it's a fun ride. And, and, but, but as we discussed at the beginning of this um, episode, um, there's some real human experience in it too, and some lessons to be learned, but a barrel of laughs, two barrels of laugh, one barrel of heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's like unique and inspiring. And it's kind of like human interest story too, right? Cause this is so mm -hmm. different and it's, it's very cool. Like I, yeah, like I said earlier, I had never heard of it. And it was just like, yeah, I'm in, that sounds, I want to learn about that uh, community or whatever it would be called, I guess, right? It'd be a community. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> could, I, could, I, could I ask one more about Hillary? Ask I'll, away. Okay. I'll only, only ask a couple more. But yeah, so Hillary, I was just curious because, like, were, was that the edit that you're most nervous about, Scott? Just because, like, yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've seen uh, Kong Fistful of Quarters, but like there's like kind of like uh, a character in that film that's kind of like seems like a villain in a way with within his edit. So I was just curious if you were, you were nervous about hers in the same way. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was nervous to show the movie to everybody and slowly it's happening this week, you know. Um, I, I was nervous because, you know, Hillary is awesome. She's fa she's fantastic. She's in and in I in any how could I villainize anybody who you know dedicated their time and their trust into me and and what sort of person would I be if once given that trust to kind of make them look evil or or something like that that would have been a, a you know just a it would have ruined the trust and and it's something I wouldn't be able to sleep with at night. Um, with that said. Hillary has some outrageous statements and she kind of en enjoys being the disruptor. And, you know, uh, she just, she loves it. She loves in, uh, getting a reaction out of people. I mean, she, she talks about this in the movie. She's pretty transparent about it. She's like, hate my table, but like have a feeling about it, which is an interesting thought. You know, it's like having a reaction is better than just something that, oh, I think I saw that movie or I think I saw that piece of art. I just can't remember or I hated it. Hating something is a strong reaction and that's what she loves. Um, so I was uh, I was struggling while editing, figuring out how I wanted to portray her. And I just I said I'm going to make it the most honest as possible. I'm not going to do reality TV show editing. Why would I do that where you twist words and make people say things they're not going to say because it's people are going to find out. They're going to say that. I mean, why how could I do that? And so I was very nervous. So I sent it to her last night and um I saw a text from her because she had figured out finally how to put it onto the TV from the phone, you know, um, and and it was around 11 o'clock. I see the text. Oh, we we saw the movie dot dot dot. And I was like, OK, this, there's a there's too much to um, unpack here. Uh -huh. um, so I'm just going to go to sleep and then I'm going to call her in the morning. Uh, so I did call her in the morning and I get her in the phone and she's like, we saw it. And I was like, uh huh. Uh, and she's like, do you want to hear my honest thoughts? And I was like, uh-huh. And she's like, I loved it. And I was like, Oh, thank God. And she goes, I did. She goes, there was a few moments that I, uh, that were cringeworthy for me. And she's like, and also she, she's like, I looked fat in it and, but I put on 30 pounds since then. So I don't know what's going on. I'm like, no, no, no. We all see that when we see our pictures of ourselves and all this sort of stuff. And so she's like, but the one moment that I kind of feel a little bit off about is the, the moment when uh, you know she completely rips apart Tim's table, not having known it, but she, you know, after he, she said that, she um, said, "But you know what? Um, I still back it. It looked like pieces of poop hanging from the thing." So you know, <laughs> you, God love her. She, she's, she's no lying. She's the disruptor no of the lie. table setting world. 
Um, so I was nervous. I was nervous showing to Tim. And then um, there's another subject in the film, Crystal Young, who will be watching it tonight. And, um, you know, she was another person in the film who is going through some stuff in her personal life while filming this. And um, we'll see. We'll see how she likes it. I mean, I don't know how she could not. She comes across so lovable in the film. But a lot of people, there's a lot of controversy with her table in the movie, as you've seen, about her country theme. And some people feel it's cheating. And so, um, you know, everybody gets it a little bit. Everybody, and then everybody stings and everybody gets stinged in the movie. But I think that's what makes for a, a fun, honest movie. Yeah. Fucking hay, right? <laughs> <laughs> The fucking barns. So I'm done with them. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> Just like you did, that part cracked me up too. And I'm the one that said it. <laughs> and you know what was funny about that line is is I didn't um I'd probably filmed with Tim that scene before we had filmed with um so the, in the movie uh, the, a lot of people feel that they cheat by doing country themes, like going to the fair and seeing the country theme, you know, is that cheating? I don't know. You know, if you're like, um, you people want to win. It's, there's no cheating, you know, like, uh, but everyone I, we'd interviewed with Tim and I was like, you know, what don't you like to see on a table? And he's like, Oh, uh, I don't know if I can swear in this. Can I swear in this? <laughs> He, yes, he goes, yes, okay, Tim goes, he goes, you know, how many times on a table can I see a red fucking barn? And then it just cuts the crystal, putting the barn in, and this barn. wasn't something, we'll, yeah, we didn't film the barn ahead of time. And I'm like, yo, what up with barns? And then he starts going on about tablecloth and all these things that actually Crystal was putting on the table saying, like, ooh, this looks nice, this looks nice. And it's, it's, it's juxtaposed with Tim's commentary on, uh, yeah. you know, th th these, these, damn fair themed tables. And so there's, you know, it gets heated. Table setting world is cutthroat. <laughs> it, that, it, it, I was crying, I was laughing so hard. Cause just, I was just like, damn it, Scott. Like you just like, how did this work out so perfectly for this? Like how dare you? <laughs> but just to preface it, I will say, I don't think it's cheating. I'm just tired of seeing it. Put the country shit away, I'm done. I don't want to see it. <laughs> That's it. That's the only thing that I mean on that. I don't think it's cheating. If if that's what you want to do, do it. I, I put the put the hay away. Put it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just just the documentary structure of this. Like, I feel like he could learn so much of just like studying editing and just like how per like like you're saying how perfectly it, it works. I don't know why I chopped at the camera there. How perfectly it works out <laughs> with the juxtaposition and stuff, right? Thank you. I will take that as a compliment. Yeah, my background is um, commercial editing. I edit a lot of commercials, which is you have to tell us a, a big story in 15 seconds, you know? And so it's a lot of taking words and how you put them under and then, you know, cheating that word in because you only got 15 seconds and the island is three seconds. So you really only have 12 seconds to tell the story and, and it's telling a lot of information a little amount of time. And so some of the original edits that I was making of this film was edited like a commercial. And then I, you know, some early feedback I got from people were, whoa, dude, we need a breath here. We need a minute where we're like, we can breathe because there's just too much information. You miss it all. And so I went back and took out words and let things breathe. And it was a learning process, learning how to edit a documentary um, or, or not also a package for TV, something that's three minutes, you know, reality based where you need ever so much that you need to get done and telling a story and you know, an hour and 45 minutes as opposed to telling it in three minutes or 15 seconds um, was a big lesson for me in this. But there are elements of commercial editing in some of the montages. And I think it, it adds for a, hopefully uh, an entertaining watch. For sure. There's a super cut in that movie that killed me. Is, is that what, is, what is that? Which one is that? Well, can I talk about it? I, want, I didn't want to give away too much, but the, the super cut with the judges. Adorable. Oh yeah, go for it. The adorable supercut ruined me. I had, like I had to pause to get through the laughing, the laughing that I was doing. I couldn't get through it because the supercut of them saying adorable and them be right beforehand saying they don't have enough words, descriptive words, and then the supercut of adorable. I wanted to be a meme so bad. He had a thesaurus, <laughs> and it's like it turns into a drinking game if you <laughs> take a shot every. You'll be dead. And you know what the funny thing? 
So in the movie, um, the, there's the judges. So everyone sets these tables up and then it's all in the hands of the judges inevitably. So, you know, they spend the six, eight months working on the table and then boom, it's just these judges moods, you know, and they go around, they judge the tables, they find what's wrong with it. Half of it's objective, half of it's subjective. Um, and then it's the only competition in the entire fair. And believe me, there's a lot of them that where you can actually read the judges notes when you go around and look at it. So, um, that's kind of what appealed me to this when I first saw it is you walk around and you're looking at these tables and there's notes and there's like, well, the table's here. And, and I was like, well, hold on now. I think the, you know, I don't know how I feel about this table. I've never had an opinion about setting the table ever. And all of a sudden I, here I am and everyone's doing the same thing. And so what's, it, so they have to take their thoughts, put them onto a piece of paper and they kind of get hung up on the same two words over and over and over and over again. And I learned this in the edit. And quite frankly, that scene was about five minutes longer in the original cut. I had to cut out a lot of the times they said these same words over and over again. Um, they were fantastic, fantastic luck finding those judges for this film. Can we get a super cut of the super cut? Like, can we get an extended <laughs> cut of the, of the super cut? Like, as a, I don't extra think, on the DVD. I don't think I can edit this movie anymore. What you see <laughs> is what you get. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> so my very last one, I just wanted to shout out, just like if they're ever watching, the the Water Babes. Uh, Cheryl, she she reminded me of Kristen Wiig. I don't know if anyone else gets that sense, but... A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Yeah, the Water Babes are great. That's another... I mean, you're probably wondering out there how many people are in this movie. It's a lot, but um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully... Uh, you can navigate it all. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, like a swim team, um, um, a 60 plus swim team that, that sets a table and competes and they work on it in the, in the pool and they're supposed to be getting exercise, but the lifeguards let us know that they don't really exercise. They're just talking about tables and, <laughs> and um, there's, they have a table reveal party uh, in the film and where they reveal the table to everyone before they entered into the contest. And, uh, all I'm going to say is this: they reveal a lot more than the table in that in that scene. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, I'm not going to say nothing. I'm saying no. nothing. You, you got to watch it. it. Yeah. You got to see what you got to see for what he means. Everybody's got to watch it. Do you want to plug it again, Scott, for hot dogs? Yeah. Um, so through um, May 9th. It's all across Canada, everywhere in Canada. It's um, go to hotdocs.ca or setdocumentary.com. It'll link you right through. Get your ticket to set. Uh, who knows if you'll ever see it again? It all depends on if somebody buys it or not. This could be your only opportunity <laughs> to see the movie. Hopefully not, but uh, you know, just in case, get your ticket and check it out. You know, it's 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 laugh every other minute <laughs> type of movie. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot more to unpack that we didn't spoil here. <laughs> Awesome. So Scott Golick, director, producer, and editor of Set, uh, a table setting documentary, and, and Tim Wyckoff, one of the documentary subjects in the film. Thank you so much for chatting Set with me on the Film Crazy Show. Thank you for having us. Thank you.